imagine this. You order your head to stop, to stop moving. Your head ignores you. Your mind is going wild within your pounding head. You're angry, frustrated, and confused. Seconds roll on feeling like minutes, hours even, and then your entire body is shaking without your control. When you finally awaken from this, you realize that you've just had a seizure. Or imagine something like this, waking up every day wishing you hadn't, feeling as if there's a giant black hole which has sucked out all the happiness from your life, leaving behind only pain and suffering. And this pain has been with you, not for months, but for years now. And you're beginning to come to terms with the fact that you may have depression. Or how about something like this? Every touch, every prick is magnified 1,000-fold. Hypersensitivity, they call it. And it's something you've had to deal with ever since you were five years old and diagnosed with autism. These illnesses can have a devastating impact on a person's life. And these patients need as much love and support as they can get. Unfortunately, they often receive the opposite. Patients get shame and embarrassment for symptoms they have and cannot even control. We are profoundly affected by society's perception of our illnesses, so much so that our very own well-being can be at stake. This is what a typical treatment map looks like for a person who has a chronic disorder. Symptoms lead to a diagnosis, which in turn leads to treatment and follow-up care. Think about a stubbed toe or a headache. You would go through a similar process. But often, there's an obstruction present in a stigmatized disorder. And stigma prevents patients from seeking any sort of diagnosis. Forget about treatment and follow-up care. We place so much emphasis on finding new medications. $39.5 billion goes into medical research in the United States every year. But we don't think about this. A person with depression may not even want the, to seek medical attention. And they may suffer from symptoms, needlessly so, until it could lead to suicide. And then all the medical advancements in the world would not help this patient. So what exactly is stigma? I think we've all felt a degree of stigma to some extent in our lives. It's those glances you get for running into a lecture 20 minutes late. Or it's those stares you get when you wear sneakers in a five-star restaurant. But for a person with a chronic disorder, it's something far deeper and much more profound. In a way, it's related to racism, where a single characteristic defines that entire person. And it's not something you can just take off, the way you can take off your sneakers after you come home. And the stigma is something that is incredibly widespread. Let's look at the case of epilepsy. 50 million people in the world have epilepsy today, making it the most common neurological disorder. Of these 50 million, 80% live in third world countries. And of these 80%, three of every four patients do not receive proper treatment. And this is despite the fact that there are inexpensive anti-epileptic drugs readily available to them. This treatment gap is far too wide. And throughout my undergraduate career, I devoted myself to understanding what this history of stigma actually was in epilepsy. I was shocked by what I found. As Rajendra Kale said in his 1997 article, the history of epilepsy can be summarized by 4,000 years of ignorance, superstition, and stigma, followed by 100 years of knowledge, superstition, and stigma. He couldn't have been any more accurate. In ancient Mesopotamia, epilepsy was attributed to the hand of sin. Even in the Bible, Jesus casts out the devil from a young boy who was simply having epileptic seizures. In the early 19th century, epilepsy was attributed to mental retardation, religious ecstasy, and even extreme violence. Crazy, right? But a law was still put in place until the 1970s, which prohibited epileptics from getting married in the United, in the United Kingdom. 
And it was this last fact that I found to be the most striking. I began to conduct clinical research regarding the psychosocial effect of epilepsy and the role it plays in marriages. And I conducted research here at the Stony Brook Medical Neurosciences Center and also abroad at the John Radcliffe Hospital. And while I was at Oxford University working at the JR Hospital, I was very inspired because who doesn't think at Oxford? And while I was there, I was always thinking of a way to bring the research I was doing back to a practical application. And 40 minutes every day consisted of me going from Abington to the JR Hospital. And in these 40 minutes, commute, I, was, I began thinking of destigmatizing theories rather than listening to my iPod or flipping through a magazine like a normal person. And while I was doing this, and as I talked to my mentors around me, I came with I came up with something. And these were my destigmatizing theories. The first is this. Education can challenge misconceptions. I think too often we fear what we do not understand. And illnesses are often fear feared because we don't know too much about it. Medical science has done tremendous amount of work in understanding every aspect of thousands of different diseases. And peer-reviewed journals are overflowing with information. However, this information can often be very difficult to understand, and it's full of medical jargon that isn't exactly accessible to the public. But what if this knowledge was available to everyone? My second theory of destigmatizing is empathy through a holistic perspective. When we think of someone who is an epileptic, or we think of someone who is depressed, what do we think of? Sure, we may feel bad for the person, but we also think that they're a burden to society. They aren't doing much to contribute to us. We need to shift this perspective. Vincent van Gogh's famous Starry Nights. I think we've all seen this painting at some point in our lives. But how much do we know about the painter and Vincent van Gogh himself? Born with temporal lobe epilepsy, Van Gogh suffered from severe seizures throughout his life, ending his life at the age 37 due to, due to severe depression. What if we imagined Van Gogh to be an epileptic or someone who was just very depressed rather than the visionary and amazing artist that he was? What if we had done this not only for Van Gogh, but for people such as Aristotle, Da Vinci, Theodore Roosevelt, Socrates, Alexander the Great, Chris Brown, even Kelly Osborne. What if we had done it for all of these people who have had at least a seizure in their life? What if we just shrugged them off and thought that they weren't really doing much for us? All of these people contained so much talent that would have gotten lost. And for people who have a disorder, it's only an issue for them. It's not their identity. So it's these two theories that I combined together to form my project. It was really quite simple. All I wanted to do was bring a human aspect back into science. The Humanology Project works to destigmatize illnesses that are commonly perceived in a negative light in society. We do this through a multi-pronged approach. The first is this. Students translate peer-reviewed literature into readable blog posts. This is done through a three-step process. We have 17 interns working on this project through the Women in Science and Engineering program here at Stony Brook. What they do is they take academic articles and convert it into a rough draft to be viewed by professors. And then they're reviewed by professors who are currently doing research in the field of the illness we currently have depression, autism, and epilepsy. After they're reviewed to, con to confirm the accuracy and clarity of the posts, they're then published online to be viewed by the public. This is what it, the end result looks like. 
This is a blog post I wrote on catching the cause of epilepsy. And as more and more people started joining in the project, and we had even more blog posts going up with amazing information, I realized that a lot of this information, well, all of this information, actually, is in English. And we're limiting our audience drastically by doing this. So aside from, di from translating medical literature into the readable blog posts, we're translating these blog posts into different languages. We're currently working to translate all of our blog posts into languages such as Hindi. And not only are we doing this, we're writing custom-made blog posts to that country. Right now, we're looking at stigma in India, because that can be very different from stigma anywhere else. The second aspect of my project is the share your story aspect. What I wanted to do was create a platform where patients and their families can share their story not just what their symptoms are like, but what they are as people and what their personality really is like. Actually, stories are very, very essential to the very process of medicine. When a person is diagnosed with something or has something that is feeling a bit off about them, they go to a doctor. And upon arriving to the doctor's office, tell them their entire story for however, however long they've been experiencing these symptoms. It could be months, even years. And these stories are then translated and refined into medical terminology, which can lead to a diagnosis. This medical terminology is what we hear about. But what if we heard about the stories? What if we heard stories about artists, visionaries, inventors, and thinkers? What if we heard about not only the illness, but the person behind that illness? I wish for us to learn from one another, to not only understand, but to celebrate our differences, and through education, for us to gain compassion and lose ignorance. For it is more important to know what sort of person has a disease than to know what sort of disease a person has. Thank you.